Good morning and welcome to Good Soul Church. I'm Dave, the pastor here, and I just pray that you came in today as excited for this beautiful day, this warm day. I, I love how many people are sitting outside under those fans. It might be better than in here. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but it's just a very warm day, but it's just a warm day because it's Mother's Day. And I want to say officially, Happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the room, the grandmas in the room, the aunties in the room, the the big sisters who act like moms and save dads sometimes. Those uh, those uh, big sister moms who uh, find the kid falling off the thing when the dad didn't see the thing. You know, the big sisters, the uh, anyone who's really been in that role of nurturing, caring for the next generation. Like that's um, such an important thing that today. With the world just being a mess, sometimes we just need a good mom. We need, we need a mom figure in our life to just uh, love us when we're hurting, to reprimand us when we need to be reprimanded. And, you know, and so I just uh, want to honor you today, um, the moms in the room. And so uh, actually all the ladies in the room, I wanted to show you this. This is a little scripture card that Corey decided uh, we all needed, uh, all the moms needed, all the ladies needed. So in the back, uh, next to the, the box, back there, the blue box, um, there's four of these different cards, and, and any lady in the room, from the youngest girl to the oldest lady, um, grab one of these. And I just hope that it's uh, just a blessing to you, a little blessing card that, that you look at, you read through, and uh, that you hold on <coughs> on your person as you walk through the day, walk through the week, knowing that you're loved, you're cared for, we honor you, we love you. And as a church, I want you to know that uh, if you ever need anything, uh, we're here for you. That's why the church is here. It's to be family for you. And so whether you're a single mom, a struggling mom, a thriving mom, the church should be a place where you find rest, where you find comfort, you find support, and just know that that's what we're here for. So don't hesitate to reach out. But I want to take a moment and honor uh, the mother of this house, and that is Danielle. Um, I just love you. And she is uh, the greatest nurturer, teacher, wrangler of five amazing kids that I've ever met. She does all that while running a large homeschool co-op that, that a bunch of people in the community are in, and she pours her life out for others, like anyone who knows her. She's a mother to so many, and she creates environments where women feel loved and supported and appreciated. And she loves other women's kids, like they're her kids, and that's hard to do sometimes with other people's kids, you know? They're not always that good. And and, uh, and so she's a prayer warrior. I want you to know she prays for our church. She prays for you. She prays for all the moms in the room. And, and her desperate part is that every single mom feels loved. Feels like she's known by the Father. And that she feels supported as she's walking through raising kids and trying to build a family and a home. And so we love you. I love you. And I'm so honored to, uh, to have met you 22 years ago. And, uh, and you uh, saved me from being a guy who uh, probably was going the wrong direction. And, and because of you, I actually know the Lord. Uh, she um, helped introduce me to the Lord. And, and now she, we're raising our children to know the Lord. And I think that's the most important thing we can do as parents. And, and moms play such a vital role in that. So love you. And it's just such an amazing day. So I hope that all the moms feel loved and honored today. And, and um, understand that this church family is a place of families. It's a place where if you're... By yourself, you're single, you can find family in the church. God, God said he places the lonely in families, and that's what the church was. But if you have a family, maybe your family's disjointed. Well, the church can be a stable family as your family's recovering and being healed and whole. But if, uh, if you have a great family, a thriving family, guess what? The church family just comes alongside you and helps enhance that and make it better. And actually, you can be such a blessing to the church. And so I just want you to know that you're never supposed to do life on your own. And as we honor mothers today, just know that this place is a place where you can feel loved, comforted, appreciated, and that we're always going to be here for you. And it's a Sunday morning, and that's when the church gathers, right? It's a, it's a time where we all come together, read God's Word, worship together, fellowship, pray together. And, um, and we've been studying on Sundays for almost a year the book of John, the Gospel of John. And, and today, we're actually getting close to the end. I know, I know it's all... Uh, no, no one said that? Oh, um, uh, yeah. So um, we're actually going to wrap up John next week, the book of John next week. And we've been in this book... For 10 months. And, and I don't know what churches you've been a part of in the past, but a lot of times you wouldn't sit in, in the scriptures like that for that long. And, and I just felt like God has given me 
A supernatural patience to allow him to speak through his word and not to be in a rush to the next best thing. And I think that's a problem in culture right now. Is like, the next best thing. What's the next best thing? And, and I think God has so much for us just to sit and read and learn. And so we've been in this. It's been an amazing study. I hope you've enjoyed it. We have the scripture journals. If you ever want to catch up, when I, went to, when I moved to Birmingham, I really felt like I'd missed a bunch from the pastor there. And so I actually went back and watched all his old messages and wrote my own notes by myself in the middle of the night in the hospital. And if you ever want to do that, we have the scripture journal still in the other room. And you can go back and watch the old messages. But we are today in John 20. Next week, John 21, and we'll be done with the Gospel of John. But today's message is one of the most powerful you'll ever hear, not because it's coming from me, but because of what John 20 contains. It is actually the crux, the, the, the epitome of our faith is contained in John 20. See, John 20 talks about the aftermath of Jesus' crucifixion and burial. It talks about the empty tomb. It talks about the risen Jesus' encounter with Mary Magdalene and the disciples, and, and then him giving them a commission to go and be the hands and feet of Jesus to the world. It's action packed. It's the centerpiece of our faith. And if you want to know what Christians believe, it's John 20. That's it. Jesus died. He was buried. And on the third day, he was resurrected. And now he offers eternal life to all who believe. John 20. We're going to see it all today as we go through this. It's powerful. I hope to get through it all. I'm working to get through it all. I want to um, land the plan at the very end with um, the end of John 20, where John actually wraps up the whole thing for us. And so, uh, someone asked me the other day a question. They said, why do we meet on Sundays and not Saturdays? And, you know, it's one of those gotcha questions, right? You know, they're coming from a little bit different doctrinal belief where they wanted to make sure they, they established why. And I said, listen, I don't know. I don't know why some man decided this, but I do know that it wasn't decided by a man in the third century. It was actually decided by the church right after Pentecost. I'll show you. In Acts 27, it says this. On the first day of the week, that's Sunday, when we all gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. So Acts 20, the church has been established for a couple months, maybe a year, and Christians were celebrating the resurrected Jesus on Sunday. And now, I don't know, you know, maybe there was still the past, the Sabbath celebration on Saturday. They didn't speak much to that. We just know early in the church, Sunday became the day because of John 20. Because what happened on that third day, on that Sunday, the first day of the week, Jesus rose from the grave, and the Christians gathered in the temple courts to say, today is the day our Savior was raised. That's why we celebrate on Sunday. Celebrate every day. But Sunday is a great day to celebrate that death has been vanquished and eternal life has been granted to all those who would believe the first day of the week. And we saw that the early disciples, all they did was preach Jesus on the cross and Jesus resurrected. That was the message. They didn't get caught up on all the doctrinal things here and, and my, my preferences here. No, they said Jesus died and was resurrected and you can have new life. And because they focused on that, the Sunday became this incredible celebration pointing directly to the day. Today, Jesus was raised from the dead. And that's why we celebrate on Sunday. You might say, well, well, you know, there's a lot of faith backgrounds that believe different things. What, what makes Christianity different? It's all about John 20. Because on Sunday, the, established, the, the person who established this faith, Jesus, was raised to new life. Every other religion is based off of some teacher. Or based off of some personality, the major four religions, right? You have Buddha, you have Muhammad, um, you have Abraham, even in the Jewish faith. And then you have Jesus, the four. Only one claimed to rise from the dead. Only one claimed to have power over death, hell, and the grave. That's why Christianity is different. That's why we are unique. That's why it is exclusive. And as we read through John 20, you'll see that every other religion doesn't make the claims that Christianity makes. And so as we read through this, we see the proofs of Jesus' resurrection. I pray that it encourages you, builds your faith, and you see why you can believe what happened on that Sunday. And so we're going to jump into it, and we're going to see that these Jesus followers who walked with Jesus for three years go from wait, like a faith that was you know, on the cusp of falling apart, sadness, to unshakable joy, and a faith that could not be 
stopped. And so let's dive in today, John 20, 1 and 2. It says this, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. So I want to quickly remind you that Jesus was buried in a garden tomb, buried by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who were both in the Sanhedrin. Joseph was a wealthy man. Nicodemus was a leader of the Sanhedrin. And, and they wanted to honor this rabbi, this Messiah figure. And so they asked Pontius Pilate, can we take him down off the cross? And this is on the Friday night, right before the Sabbath dinner. So they had to do it quickly. They pulled Jesus down, covered in blood and, and mangled. And they walked into the garden tomb, Joseph's family's garden tomb, which had never been used. And Nicodemus brings 75 pounds of fragrances, oils, and, and uh, let's say like, you know, just paste. And they covered Jesus' body, anointed his body, with the amount of uh, oils and, and these uh, anointing um, fragrances that was the same as the royalty would have had. So they gave him a royal burial. And it was in haste, though. It was right before the sundown. And they couldn't be touching a dead body after sundown. So it was a big deal. So they placed him in the tomb. They rolled the stone. And these stones that were rolled, they were actually very special. They would roll slightly downhill and they'd go into a notch. And these things weighed two to three tons. These stones that, that covered the... They sealed the tomb. They were supposed to seal the tomb for a year. And then a year later, men would come out and, and move that away and the body would be gone. It would be decomposed. After a year, they, they'd put you in um, an ossuary, a, a little box, and they'd put you on a shelf. That's how the Jewish burials happened. But because the process happened so quickly, they couldn't go back on Saturday. It was the Sabbath. And then Saturday night happens the sundown. So the next time you could possibly go to the tomb was Sunday morning. And so the evening had fallen the Sunday was coming, and the first opportunity to have that you could have gone to the tomb, who's there? But Mary Magdalene. And in John's Gospel, we hear that it's Mary, but in the other Gospels, we hear that Mary is with other women. They've come to the tomb early, and they're going to go to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. That's what the other Gospels say, that they're going to go maybe finish the process that Joseph and Nicodemus couldn't get to, all the things that they wanted to give a proper burial. And so... This proper anointing was going to happen, and, and they did not expect the resurrection. You ever think about that? They were going to anoint a dead body. But these are the followers of Jesus. Today, we think about it, it's, it's so simple. Oh, yeah, Jesus, th third day, raised from the dead. He said it all throughout the gospel. Like, but remember, they don't have anything written down. They've been walking with Jesus. They just saw their Messiah crucified and tortured. They're devastated. And in the sadness and in their doubt, they don't ever think it's actually going to happen. I want everyone to, everyone who came to the tomb that day did not expect a resurrected king. And so, we see Mary Magdalene show up, it was still dark, and this would indicate the fourth watch of the night. The Roman watches were broken into four, and this would be between 3 and 6 a.m., right before the sun comes up, um, so early. And you're wondering why would Mary be there so early? It's, this woman by herself in the garden, right? You know, the women, she's probably ahead of the women. That's kind of how it, it reads in John. Well, Mary probably couldn't sleep. Probably couldn't sleep for a day and a half. Mary, the woman that Jesus saved, the woman of the night who had been tortured by seven demons, who was in utter darkness when she met Jesus three years before, he saved her. And now, in the midst of what, what she thought was going to be a, a new life, in Christ, the new life with her Messiah, has been devastated by the, his loss. Um, she probably never left his side for three years. You can imagine this woman who had, was from a, an area called Magdala, which was known for prostitution and darkness. Uh, we read that she was actually saved from seven demons. and So this woman had been made whole by <coughs> Jesus. And you can just imagine how her life was so different. And now... It, it feels like it's falling apart. And so she can't sleep. She, all she wants to do is be beside her rabbi. Be beside the one who saved her. And so Mary Magdalene loved Jesus because Jesus first loved her. And, and he changed the direction of her life. And he saved her from darkness. And, and so on that Sunday morning, she was just desperate to be in his presence. Even in the presence of his dead body, she just needed to be there. So the first time she could go, she went. 
And it's not uncommon to see people grieving go to the gravesite. You know, go to the tomb. Go, go to the place. You see them all the time. We, we were up in, uh, on our last trip, we were driving through um, a national cemetery. And you just saw people standing by a gravesite. And the, the, the spirit's not there anymore. The body's there, but the spirit's not there. So, but there's some, there's some semblance of like, you know, peace and being near the person that you were with for so long. And, and that's what I think Mary was expecting to feel. To, to feel that I'm going to be near the man who saved my life. And um, some of the people who, uh, who do that, I don't know what they're expecting, but they probably weren't expecting at that National you know, Arlington Cemetery to go there and, and have an empty grave. right? That's not what we're expecting when we go into grieve at a gravesite. And uh, so at this point in the story, Jesus has surprised everyone with his resurrection. Even those who are closest to him. They didn't expect him to conquer death, hell, and the grave. Isn't that interesting? That the, the people that we are building our faith off of their testimony didn't actually believe it until it happened. So she sees this empty grave and immediately assumes grave robbers. Assumes someone rolled a the thing, they stole his body, I need to go tell the boys, right? And so you saw she runs back, finds Peter and John immediately, and says, they've taken the Lord. Out of the tomb, I don't know where he's at, it was empty, right? And so what happens? Well, they start running. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping in to look, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but did not go in. So John and Peter just take off running. The moment Mary says it, they're gone. And even, uh, so John's pretty humble. He never names himself in his Gospels, right? Like, you know, he just says, oh, the other disciple. But he also, at the same time, in that humble way, says, the one that Jesus loved, right? He says that. But I just love the humble brag here that he says, um, I outran Peter to the tomb. Just, you know, we're just, you know, we're there. I took off, and just my, my 400 times just was a little better than Peter's, right? He's a, he's this is humble brag. And we know that he was the youngest of the disciples. Peter was likely the older of the disciples. And so maybe a 10 to 15 year gap. So this is really John writing the young guy just beat the old guy, right? That's what he's saying in this moment. And so watch what happens next, though. This is funny. So then Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. So he just walked right by John. He's like, you're on the ground? Okay, I'm going, right? And he saw the linen clothes lying there, the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up on a place by itself. So Peter, who's now out of breath from the race, because he's the older guy, right? But he just goes right past John. He's like, you stay there, boy. I'm going in, right? And he runs right into the tomb. See, we know this about Peter. Peter's impulsive. Peter's passionate. Like, when you, you don't mess with Peter, Peter's just going to step in, right? And so he probably was offended by the getting beat, right? So he's just like, I'm going to prove to you. So he goes in without hesitation, desperate to know more about what's going on with Jesus. And um, John was more hesitant. We know John's more contemplative. John's more cerebral. He's thinking, like, what's going on? What, what, what's happening? But he doesn't wait too long, and he responds in kind, and he goes in himself. He says, Then the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So it's kind of a dramatic, like a very short section that says, He went in after Peter, he saw something, believed, but the full revelation of all of it wasn't there yet, and then they went back home. Well, um, what I think we're, we're seeing here is that uh, Peter steps in and has a response. And then John steps in, sees something different, and has a completely different response. And it says, he believed. Everything became clear to John when he walked into the tomb. When he was standing outside the tomb, unclear. When he went into the tomb, clarity. His doubt became belief, and his fear was replaced with faith. So what changed, right? So over the last five verses, I'm not going to go back and show them all to you, but John described a progressive awareness of what was happening by using three different Greek words for the word saw, S-A-W, like I saw something. Three different words in five verses. For the, when we read it in English, it's saw, he saw, he saw, right? But they're different words. And so the first was when John ran up to the tomb and he stopped and it said he saw the linens, but nothing changed. And so that word, that Greek word is called blepo, and it means he just noticed. So, so John, waiting at the entrance, notices linens, but doesn't think too much of it. 
He's not processing the linens. He's probably overwhelmed with this excitement, grief, whatever it is. Doesn't understand the power of the resurrection yet, right? So then Peter comes in, runs directly into the tomb, and the word they use for what he saw, he saw the linen clothes as well. It's thoreo. So it's the same word we uh, think of for theater. And what happens in a theater? You're there for two hours and you're just like, hmm, I get it. Oh, character development. I love it. Okay, we're here. I'm going to speak to, oh, this is nice. You're, like, you're kind of taking it all in, studying the environment. It means to study closely. And um, it's a place where you spend time thinking about the thing that you're witnessing, right? Like you have two hours to process a play. And then at the end, you're like, I get it. I get it. So Peter's not there yet. He didn't get it. But uh, Peter's studying the scene, trying to make sense of it. It's the guy who's like, mm hmm, mm hmm, doesn't know what he's talking about, but, but agrees with the moment, right? And so he's nodding, but at the same time, not the right conclusion. He's thinking also, grave robbers, what's happening? But then John says, I stepped into the tomb. I saw and I believed. And this is the word horeo. And horeo means to pierce with intelligent comprehension. To finally see with understanding. So John went in and finally understood. So John finally got it and he believed immediately. When he saw the grave clothes, close up, he knew the resurrection had taken place. So why? So remember how they buried people. We see this described throughout the Bible that they would wrap strips of linen around you, but they're, they're soaked in that paste, that oil, those fragrances, and it almost becomes hard, almost like a mummy. You would think of like a mummy when you think of how they wrapped the Jewish men when they died. And they'd place a linen cloth, a napkin over the face, a separate linen cloth. And so think about Lazarus. Remember, Lazarus was raised from the dead, walks out in grave clothes. Those would have been linen strips. And Jesus says, now unbind him. Like, you need people to help unwrap your grave clothes, right? That's what Jesus said. So think of Lazarus. So Peter and John expected to find linen clothes, or expected to find linen there, but not how they saw it, right? Not perfectly positioned, as if there's no body in it, but just kind of falling down. That's, that's how it's described in the Bible. So imagine linen strips in the perfect shape of a man lying there. So grave robbers just taking the body, right? Running out, right? It, so there's no linens. Or, you know, maybe Jesus didn't die. Maybe he was just asleep, right? There's some theories that maybe, he, you know, he was re you know, resuscitated after the crucifixion. Well, you would unwrap the body and you put a pile of linens on the ground. So either way, they shouldn't be perfectly placed. You would have had to rip them open to leave them. And so when John saw that they're in perfect position, he's like, there's no way. That has to be the resurrection. That has to be his body's gone, like miraculously, by God. And so undisturbed, not ripped, not in a pile, the body just disappeared. And it's what the resurrection would look like to a man whose eyes were open to what it could be. And so um, his eyes were finally open, he finally understood, and in that moment he believed. But I want to point out something else to you that you may have just read over that I thought was just the coolest thing. So back in John 20, 6 and 7, it says this, Peter came, he saw a face cloth there that had been on Jesus' head, not lined with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. So the folded napkin seems like an odd detail to put in this whole thing, right? Um, but think about it this way. Jesus took the time after being pulled out of the linen that remained in place, enough to take a face cloth either off or off of the body that was there, fold it perfectly, and place it next to the head of the linens. You can see the scene? Jesus did that. And so, this points directly to a Jewish tradition of a master and a servant. So a servant would spend all night setting a table for dinner. And then he would step behind like a wall. He would hide. And he'd be looking at the table as the master was hosting and eating and, and celebrating whatever he was. And if the master was not done with the meal, um, he would, uh, uh, if he was not done with the meal, he would fold his napkin up very neatly and place it on the table. And the, the Jewish boy would not run out to reset the table or clear the table. He would wait because the master is returning. If the master bundled it up and threw it down on the plate, immediately he would go and clear the table. So this Jewish tradition of the master and the servant and, and how to say you're coming back was a folded napkin placed at the head of the table. And Jesus took the time in his resurrection moment to fold his napkin. 
and place it at the head of the table. It's absolutely a beautiful thing to say, I'm coming back. And um, it says that John saw all of this and believed. And then it says, Peter and John left the tomb and returned to their homes. And I can only imagine that John, who's now taking care of Mary, Jesus' mother, wants to run directly back to his home and tell the mother of Jesus he's raised to life. Now, he hasn't met Jesus yet. He hasn't seen Jesus yet. But the news is too good to not tell. So they run away. And we see that John is so encouraged that he runs away. You don't hear about what happens there. But he shifts directly back to the story of Mary back at the tomb. So John says, I, believe, I saw it and I believed. It's enough for you to know that. Let me tell you what happened to Mary. And so here we are in John 20, 11 through 12. It says this. I hope. Very good. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. Now, remember, Mary, Mary ran to get the boys. Mary's now made her way back to the tomb. And she's standing there weeping. And the way John writes it, it's like a wailing. It's like that grieving, wailing sound. So it would have been hysterical tears, sobs. And um, she looks into the tomb, and what does she see? It says, she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. One at the head and one at the feet. So I want to give you this etching that kind of shows this scene. This is, this is what an artist you know, rendered. It could have been, right? At the head and the feet of where Jesus had lain on the stone shelf. And Mary just overwhelmed with grief. So angels show up all the time in the Bible. They're usually messengers or they're there to do some, do some work, you know, like take, take care of some people. Well, in most instances, when an angel shows up, there's fear, right? Because we know that because an angel will say, do not fear. Because a person falls on the ground, face hurt, right? But that's not the feeling here. The feeling here is different, and it's the only time in the Bible we read about angels sitting when they present themselves to a human. And so, when I picture this, when I saw this, I was like, that feels like the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. I want to show you this. So this is what the Ark would have looked like. So the mercy seat of God is right in between the two angels with wings, the cherubim, here. And what would happen is, once a year, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, and he would take a slain lamb, and he would sprinkle the blood of the lamb between the two angels on the box, on the mercy seat, right where Jesus would have been laying in the previous picture. The high priest slay the lamb, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, surrounded by angels. It's a beautiful picture of God building something 1,200 years before this moment that pointed directly to this moment in the empty tomb. And it's something that only we can look back on and to see the glory of God represented through the whole story. Jesus' bloody body, which was sacrificed for the sins of man, is now gone, and two angels surround where the body had been lain. It's the stuff like this that just blows my mind whenever I read the Bible. Whenever I find something like that and God reveals it, I just... It encourages me, encourages me so much that his story is complete. His story makes total sense. His story is something you can believe. Amen. And I just absolutely love it. Thank you. Um, and so we move on. And so these angels now speak. And John 20, 13, 14 says this. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Woman was a term of endearment. It was an honoring term. It was not a slight to her. And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not know it was Jesus. So these angels nonchalantly ask a grieving woman at a gravesite why she's weeping. Kind of rude, like you think, like inappropriate. Obviously she's upset. Obviously she's grieving. Like, why are you weeping? Like, why are you so sad? But the thing was, they knew something she didn't know. And isn't that so true? Like, sometimes when we don't know the full plan, we don't know the full story, it's it's easy to be caught up in the grief of something when you don't know how it's going to work out. And so, even now, these angels are speaking to her as if she knows what's about to happen. And she has no idea what's about to happen. And sometimes when we face problems, we're in the middle of it, and we don't know the answer, it's easy for us to get caught up and, and have no peace. But what, what Jesus wants to offer us is peace in the midst of the problems. Because he is the author of the story. And so when, when you get to the end of the story, if we know it's all going to work out, well, if we go back into the story, then we can be at peace within the story, no matter what's happening, right? And so 
Um, Mary right now has no peace. She's grieving because all she can see is this mess. I was broken. I was awful. I was in a place of darkness. And the one thing that brought me out of that is gone. The one man who could save me from that is gone. I'm in a mess. And she's currently in that mess and cannot see clearly. So peace is oftentimes unachievable because we can't see things working out. We don't know how God is going to work this out. We don't know how this is going to play out in the future. How's my business going to be saved? How's my marriage going to be saved? How's my kid going to get healthy? I don't, I don't know. We don't know how it's going to work. And so there's no peace. But God knows the end of the story. And he promises that the end of the story is good for all those who love him and call him Lord. And so this story is about to get really good, but in the moment, Mary can't see it. It says, when she turned around, she saw Jesus. Like, didn't say like a figment of Jesus. Saw Jesus and didn't recognize him. Well, why? Well, I mean, there's a couple reasons, right? So she'd known him for three years, spent time with him every day. So how, how could she not see him for who he was? Well, one reason could be that she had no expectation that he would ever show up again. And so she's just blinded to the fact that it could be Jesus, right? If you don't expect something, sometimes you don't see it for what it is. She was looking for a missing body, not a risen Lord. And so this guy's talking to her, looking like a normal body. She's like, well, you couldn't be him because I'm looking for a body, right? Like, so could this be a blind in there? And, and this fact, the fact that none of the disciples understood the resurrection until the resurrection happened or, or got it or expected it is actually one of the biggest proofs for the faith of Jesus, right? These men who <coughs> ran away, and we'll find them in a minute, in a, in a locked room, in a moment are willing to go be martyred because of their belief in the resurrection. And so we see throughout the book of Acts, the disciples were so bold about the resurrection, they walked into hostile environments all the time saying, no, 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 I don't care what you say, Jesus is risen. And you don't get there, you don't fake something and be willing to go uh, and get you know crucified upside down for it, or your head chopped off, or, or flayed. You don't you don't do that. You might you know make a story up, but the moment the pressure comes, you're going to cave, right? So these men never did. So they were bold about the resurrection, but in this moment, Mary didn't know. She didn't recognize it, and so I wonder if it's more than just she wasn't expecting him. Is there something more to it? Well, she's grieving. She's like overwhelmed with grief. Eyes are probably filled with tears. She's probably sobbing mess, right? So maybe she just couldn't see him clearly. Like, she could have just glanced up, didn't really understand it through her emotion. Um, totally possible. Or, Jesus could have actually blinded her to seeing who he was for a moment. And you're like, well, it doesn't say that. I know it doesn't say that here. But we actually see, uh, shortly after this, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus walks up next to two disciples, and he actually withholds who he is from them. They can't see who he is until the perfect moment. So maybe the perfect moment for Mary was coming. He needed it to be set up. He needed to see her grief. He needed her to fall at his feet and be desperate before he revealed himself. And so he is always waiting for the perfect opportunity to reveal his true nature. Um, and so this man, who the last time she saw him, he was a mangled mess, bloody, beaten, bruised, and dead. He's... Mostly unrecognizable because now he's in a glorified state. And we, we see ideas of what that is in Revelation. We see what the glorified state of Jesus would be. But he's probably unrecognizable because he looks so different. He just looks so different. There's, there's something about him that's familiar. But, but the resurrected Jesus, the glorified Jesus, your resurrected body will not be what we see right now. It'll be similar to what we see right now, but it'll be glorified. It'll be in its perfect state. It'll be in its best state. I don't know what that looks like for you guys. I don't know, but when I look in the mirror sometimes, I'm like, yeah, it'll be good to change that. But, but the glorified state of Jesus, I can't imagine how beautiful, how wonderful it is. But either way, it's about to be revealed, and everything was about to change. So let's see that. In John 20, 15, he says this first. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, this is one of the funniest things. She, hey, gardener, listen. I know you took him, right? Like, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, so I will go take him away. So he asked the same questions the angels did. How could you be sad? What, who are you seeking? Like, what, what could possibly be wrong? And even after his questions to her, she didn't recognize him. She's actually even as bold as to say to this man, random man in the garden, Do you take him? Tell me where he's at. I'm going to go get him myself. 
And I don't know, I mean, what you think about that, but Jesus, let's say he's 150 pounds. He might have been bigger, but 150 pounds. 75 pounds of oils and paste on him. Well over 200 pounds. And this, this woman looks at this gardener and says, I'm going to go get it myself. Tell me where he's at. Like, and you can just imagine how obnoxious that would sound. Like, I'm going to go carry him wherever I need to carry him. And imagine Mary finding that body and then like slumping. Like, maybe she is a hoss. Maybe she's like, you know, and she just like throws over her shoulders. Where's she taking Jesus? Like, what is the plan here? Well, we have to understand that. Tell me where he is. I'm going to go take him away. Is an unreasonable thing to say. It's in her grief. She doesn't know what she's saying. She's not asking for clarity. She's just desperate to be near Jesus. Desperate to touch him again. T desperate to feel that presence that she felt that brought her out of darkness and into light. So, um, that's how love works. Like, she is so overwhelmed with emotion, but she just knows she needs to be near her Savior. She doesn't care what obstacles are in that way. You're just, I'm going to get it done. I'm going to find him and I'm going to get him where he needs to be. I'm going to make it right. And that's what true love is. You see her love for the Lord. And um, she's going to try to fix it. Fix everything that's going on. In her grief, in her desperation, she ends up rep um, reprimanding the Savior like to his face because she's so desperate to make things right. But all that's about to change because when Jesus speaks again, one word changes her life forever. And it's this. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned to him and in Aramaic said, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus simply says her name, Mary. And that one word changed everything for her. You see, Jesus is the one who formed her in her mother's womb. He's the one who named her before the beginning of time. And he's the one who rescued her out of a life of pain and darkness. And now he's speaking words over her that are like a loving father that would speak to a child. A recognizable voice, a reassuring voice, a voice that comforts, even in the most broken-hearted situations. Maybe you felt that before. You felt a soothing voice come over you when you needed to hear it. See, Mary had been become used to Jesus speaking her name in a way that was different for the past three years than what she had experienced her whole life. Think about the, the baggage that was on her name before she met Jesus. The things that were said in her name before she met Jesus. The way the demons spoke to her about her name before Jesus. The sin, the darkness. And Jesus broke that in a moment. And then every time he said her name, it was like life was coming to the bones. Like when he said her name, light in the darkness. And so she had become used to this name that he was speaking. And it's the same with each of us. Jesus made you. He named you. And when he calls you by name, you will know. It's like sheep following the shepherd, being drawn to the shepherd. And if we listen closely, God is always calling our name. And we should recognize his voice. I love John 10, 3 and 4, this description of the voice. It says, to him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice. But see, in this, we have a choice to follow that voice or not. To come under his care, into his sheepfold, or to walk away and do this thing on our own. As a sheep who's not following the shepherd. And the only one who truly loves us, unconditionally, is calling our name. Calling Mary's name. And it's how we respond to that name that changes everything. We can choose to move through this life without him. But in the moments where Mary felt most lost, when she heard her name said by the Savior, she was drawn to it, and her eyes were open, and she would do nothing but follow him the rest of her lives. She was distraught and desperate. She was desperate for someone to give her some assurance of what was happening. And we see in the moment she hears her name, and she knows for a fact that her Savior is back. No one said her name like Jesus said her name. And uh, I promise you, she thought he was gone, but the moment he said her name, he knew he was right back there in her presence. How often have we wondered how far off God is? Like, 
God, why are you so far from me? God, why are you, why won't you come near me? And, and it's so common, we see in the Old Testament, the Israelites were always crying out to God, saying, why are you so far off? When we read the scripture, you're like, he wasn't far off. He was right there the whole time. You were just blind to his presence in your life because of the sin that was in your life. The things that you had put in your life blinded you to the fact that Jesus, the Father, never left you. <coughs> so the answer to Mary's problems is standing right in front of her, and she, for a minute, does not, does not recognize it. She thinks he's so far off still. But the answer to her problems was standing right there, and the moment he said her name, she recognized it, and the, the problem solver walked into the room. And that's God's promise throughout the Bible. And Deuteronomy 31.8 says this, It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. It's one of the greatest promises in the Bible that He will not leave you. I mean, you know, James 4 says, Draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. What that means is, He's right there. You've got to take a step, and all of a sudden He comes in and embraces you. Jesus promises to be by your side. His promise for Mary, that was His promise for Mary, and it's His promise for us today. And He's right here showing her that in a simple moment, her eyes can be open to all of His nature, all of His promises for her, and it's also available for us today. We need to listen for His voice calling our name. Mary was desperately looking for her Savior. Are we desperately looking for our Savior every single day? I don't want to get to a point where I'm in her position of desperation before I start looking for my Savior. But she recognized His voice when He said her name, and it changed everything. And her response was to scream out, Teacher! This term of endearment, only a few people got to call Him Teacher. And then look at his response back to her after she claims that. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. And I want you to point out, like, do not cling to me means unhand me, like, Get off of me. Because you know what happened. She said, Rabboni, and then just like death grip. Like, wouldn't let him go. Like, she's just weeping, crying, so excited. He's probably like, yeah, love you. Yeah, this is great. We have things to do. You know, he understands that. He's got 40 days. He's got time here on earth to see all the people he needs to see. To spend time with everyone he needs to spend time with. To speak names to people who need their names spoken. So that he can equip the church. Empower the church. To ready to go out and be his hands and feet. He's like, you can't have me all to yourself, Mary. I need you to go to the guys and tell them what's coming. And isn't it funny that the first witness to the resurrected Jesus was a woman? I'm not being a chauvinist. That's not me being a chauvinist. I want to tell you, a woman's testimony in this day and age was not admissible in court. They were thought of lower than a lot of slaves. Like, so for John to say... Hey, the proof of the resurrection is this ex-woman of the night, demon-possessed, like life-changed, like person from Magdala. That's who you got to believe that the resurrection happened. It had to be true. Because if you were a Jewish man back in the day trying to make up a story, you'd be like, hey, Nicodemus, remember he's on the Sanhedrin? First one is Jesus. <coughs> resurrected. you got to believe it because it's Nicodemus, right? This learned man would never lie in court. But instead they chose probably the worst woman to give a testimony to Jewish men of the day, and she was bold. She got up and sprinted and proclaimed the risen Lord. And John made sure to note to all of us, it was Mary who saw him first. God revealed himself to her, number one, to elevate the position of women within this world. Because before this, there was nothing. Anybody who says like equal rights, Jesus is the only one who ever said that in all of culture for all of time. And after him, it all changed. So he honored Mary, said, Mary was the first I revealed myself to. And I just absolutely love that. And so, these men, do they believe the testimony of Mary or not? Well, it says uh, they do. And so here, on the evening of that first day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. What you don't notice here in the next verse is that they all said, Mary, you're... We don't believe you. What they did was they, they stayed in a place 
That Jesus said, I'm coming to you. So they gathered. They trusted Mary. Something's going to happen. But that didn't take away their fear. It didn't take away what they, what they didn't know what to expect from Jesus. They just trusted that she said something. She said, he's coming to us. Let's stay put. And so, fast forward to this evening. They're there in a locked room in Jerusalem, hidden away, full of fear and wondering what is next. And amid the darkness and confusion, Jesus shows up. There's no indication from John that a door was opened, a window was cracked. It says that Jesus showed up. So Jesus in his glorified body could get from here to there. He could walk through walls. He could be up in Galilee and back down in Jerusalem. For 40 days, Jesus could be where Jesus needed to be. And his first words to them as he showed up out of the blue, it's kind of funny, is peace be with you. Like you can imagine they're like, ah! You know, like, what's this? You know, maybe they didn't recognize him, maybe they did, but peace be with you. Jesus is here to bring peace. This moment, that's all they needed was peace. They were full of fear, grief, sadness, darkness. They needed peace. They saw their world, the one they built up in their minds for three years, falling apart. They had more questions than answers. They didn't know what was next. But in the middle of that mess, Jesus came, was in their presence, and gave them peace. And so I wrote it this way. In the middle of our problems, the presence of Jesus can bring you peace. The simple presence of Jesus in that room brought a supernatural peace that they could not name, they could not tell you what it was, except Jesus showed up. When Jesus is in the room, you know everything's going to be all right, even if your problems aren't fixed yet. They still had persecution coming, they still didn't have a lot of answers to all the questions, but they knew Jesus was there, and His presence provided peace. And so moving on, it says this, When, they, when He had said this, He showed them His hands and His side, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So he shows them his wounds. And yes, Jesus will still have wounds in his glorified body. Why is that? Because it says the glorified body, we're going to be restored to pray our best in nature. The best we could be. Why wouldn't Jesus lose the wounds? Well, because the wounds were the, the most evil man could do were represented in the wounds of Jesus. But also the greatest glory that ever happened on earth were represented in the, the wounds of Jesus. So it's like God will show the wounds. And it won't be sadness that comes over you to see wounds in Jesus. John describes a slain lamb in heaven. But the slain lamb represents conquering death, hell, and the grave. So the wounds are now a trophy for heaven to show what God could do even in the midst of the evil of man. And so Christ will be glorified in a glorified body with wounds in his hands. And, the, uh, and what he says here is, he came to bring peace, and now he's enlisting these men and this group of people to become the peace for the world. Right? Because Jesus is not going to be there past 40 days. Right? Jesus is not going to be there when, Pente when Pentecost happens. You know, the Holy Spirit comes, but Jesus' body, this resurrected body, is gone. And so all of a sudden, the church becomes the body of Christ. That is the commission of the church. So for three years, Jesus was present in his body. And when he goes away, the church now becomes the body of Christ to the world. We are, we are enlisted to bring the good news of the gospel to the world. And um, we're here to tell everyone who will listen about the only way back to heaven, back to the Father, is through Jesus. And so I, I wrote it this way. The world may never go to church, but the church is commissioned to go to the world. Sometimes in church, we, we get really comfortable with the church. Like, we like being the body of Christ. We like being there. But Jesus went and told about the kingdom of God to everyone he met. But Jesus went. So if we're now representing the body of Christ, we need to go and tell the world about the hope that was within us. And this is one of the reasons we go to Guatemala. We're going, and in three months, we're going down to Guatemala, a group of us, to go be the hands and feet of Jesus and, and tell these you know, Guatemalan widows and orphans that Jesus loves them. We came to tell you Jesus loves you. We're going to provide for your needs, the physical needs, but we're going to introduce you to the only one who can meet all of your needs, and that is Jesus. So, but we don't have to go to Guatemala to be the hands and feet of Jesus to this world. I go to work every Monday into an environment that's dark and, and hurting, 
And I try to be a representative of the body of Christ to them. They may never come to church. You know, some of my nurses, some of my friends come to church from, from work, but most never will. And I have to be okay with that. But guess what? I can speak to them about Jesus in any environment I'm in. And so, let us be the church that's commissioned to go to the world. And let's do that. And then finally here in John 20, 22 and 23, it says this, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And in this moment, I believe this is the moment of spiritual rebirth for these disciples. This is the salvation moment for these disciples. They saw him, they believed him, and he breathed on them a new spirit. Because remember, God breathed into Adam in the garden. It brought Adam life. And in that life was both physical life and spiritual life. Sin killed the spiritual life of Adam. And for us, we were born into sin means that spiritual side of us is dead in our sin. We still have a physical life that's alive. So when Jesus breathed into these men, it was the first time they felt spiritually alive for the first time. That's salvation. And so Jesus has redeemed their spiritual life with a breath. And don't you love that in the Greek and the Hebrew, um, breath means spirit. If you did you know this? Ruach in Hebrew means spirit and breath. And um, pneuma in Greek means spirit and breath. And so when Jesus breathed, into them. He was giving them a new life, a new spirit. And salvation is all about spiritual rebirth. It empowers us to do the things that God needs us to do for the kingdom. Now we'll talk and, and ask about another birth, a kind of a baptism in the Holy Spirit, a, a moment of empowering by the Holy Spirit that happened on Pentecost. But right now, this is salvation. This brings us to new life in Christ, allows us to stop living in darkness and live in light. And now with that, Jesus then gives them this commission for the church to go to the world and bring the good news. Um, the good news of forgiveness that God has already granted to all the world. So I know you read it and you're like, well, are we giving forgiveness? No, Jesus is giving forgiveness. We are the ones notifying the world of the opportunity to receive the forgiveness of God. We're the ones who tell of the good news. But then look. Who's late to the party? I know you guys were wondering, wait, where's Thomas? Well, Thomas shows up. Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So Judas is gone, and Thomas wasn't there. These two men, you know, one, sin, gone, forever. But Thomas, where was Thomas? No, we never learn what Thomas was doing, but Thomas wasn't there. And so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I never will believe. Thomas is named the twin. A lot of people think he was named the twin because he actually looked identical to Jesus. And so remember Jesus identified himself in the garden? Well, it seems like, in most of the readings I've done, they think he looked like Jesus, and so they were always, you know, uh, you know messed up when, when people asked for Jesus, they were looking at Thomas. So the twin, he's the only one who wasn't there. Thomas gets a bad rap because of this moment. The doubting Thomas. We all know doubting Thomas, right? He didn't believe right away. We didn't meet, he didn't see Jesus, right? Give him a hard time. But, but I think Thomas was the most raw and honest in the whole group. Um, he was always asking questions. He was always bringing things up. Like in the upper room, when, when Jesus is like, you're going to follow me this way. And, and, and Thomas is like, I don't know what way. God, what, like, Jesus, what way? We don't know the way. He yeah, spoke up over the whole crowd. Well, Jesus then says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if Thomas hadn't said something, we wouldn't have that great line in the Bible. And Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So he's clarifying Thomas's very you know, brash question. But I love that about Thomas. And the other thing is, I think Thomas was all in with Jesus. You know, he wasn't here. I don't know what Thomas was doing. He might have been out trying to find Jesus. He might have been doing something. But Thomas is the one who in John eleven sixteen, 16, Jesus is like, let's go to Jerusalem. And Thomas is like, all right. Let's all go. Hey, we're all going. We're going to die with Jesus. Let's go. Let's go. Like he's pulling along the disciples into a definite death. Like So Thomas was all in. He was a ride or die guy. He just wasn't in the room. And so I think Thomas also was a skeptic. And so when they're all saying, we saw Jesus, he's like, I didn't see him. His natural inclination is like, I'm, until I see him, I'm not going to trust what you're saying. So, so look what happens here. He said, I need to see it to believe it, right? And then look at this. Eight days later. Can you imagine Thomas for eight days? Just sitting there saying, I told you all. No Jesus. I don't know what y'all saw. But no Jesus. Like confident in his disbelief. Like Thomas is just kind of like, guys, 
we gotta re we gotta re reorder the wagons. Like, what are we gonna do here? Like, what's our plan, right? So Thomas is you know wheeling and dealing for eight days. So eight days later, Thomas was now with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them again and said, "Peace be with you." Then he said to Thomas, "Look at Thomas. Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe." So for eight days, Thomas was full of doubt. And in the midst of his doubt, Jesus showed up. And how many people are so sure of their unbelief in Jesus until Jesus enters the room? I was, for 21 years, I was sure of my unbelief in Jesus. Mostly all religions. I was sure that I was right, and whoever was doing that thing was wrong. I was sure, like Thomas, this is not real. And then I heard him call my name for the first time, sitting in that room, and my whole life changed. Well, look at Thomas's response to Jesus. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have seen and yet not have not seen and yet believed. My Lord and my God. Those in his lines right away when he meets Jesus in the resurrected body. He goes from doubting to instant belief. When Jesus entered the room, everything changed. For eight days he had no peace. He's wrestling with doubt, fear of the future. He was isolated because these men had a belief and he didn't. Can you imagine that isolation? Like, I don't, you guys are all in, but I don't know. I haven't seen him. And um, the other men had an experience that filled them up. And Thomas hadn't had that yet. He was on the outside looking in. But they had found joy and peace. And he was sitting there without it until Jesus showed up. And it's so common today to meet these people. Like, you just want them to know. Like, these guys pray for eight days. Like, come on, Thomas, trust me. Like, trust me. And what they needed, what he needed, what we need, is an encounter with Jesus, a personal encounter with Jesus, that changes everything. There are so many people like Thomas today. There's people like Thomas in this room. Because you don't, even if you go to church and you put on your Sunday's best, you can be in the room like he was with these disciples and not yet have heard your name called by Jesus. Have not experienced the power of the risen Lord. Um, I think it's common in the church today. Because the moment Thomas believed, he said, Lord, my Lord, my God, it was an all-in thing. And so we, I had a discussion with someone the other day about how can people be like one foot in, one foot out. I'm like, I don't think they believe. I think they like it. I think they like the idea of it. But you don't see that in the Bible. Like it was a, I'm in grief, Mary, to I am all in, Mary. I'm sprinting into danger. I, I, I don't understand Thomas. The moment I meet Jesus and his resurrected body, I'm all in. All of these men would go to their death believing. And so, we can be sitting in church, we can be sitting in this world, and say all the right things, and never actually have had that encounter with Jesus. And that was my story. At 21, I was confident in my disbelief, um, but I encountered Jesus in a real and powerful way, and it changed everything, and I never went back. And that would be my answer to anyone who says, saved, always saved, those questions you hear all the time. I'm, t I'm sorry, but when you meet Jesus for real, I don't think you can go back. Once your eyes are open to who he is and what he's done for you, how could you ever go back? Because the power of the resurrection changes everything. We saw these disciples who all doubted that Jesus was going to do what he said he was going to do throughout Scripture. All of a sudden, declare him Lord and God while they met him in a locked upper room and they busted out of those doors a few days later and preached the gospel to an unbelieving culture. They were full of unbelief, and they began to believe because of an encounter with Jesus. Thomas was filled with a supernatural peace that can only come from Jesus because of the promise of the resurrection. It's a powerful moment in the gospel story, one that shows that life changes happen, is, is possible in one moment in God's presence. And John included it at the end for a reason. And he actually tells us at the end of John 20 the reason he included all of these stories. It's John 20, 30 and 31, says this. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. I chose not to write them. But these, the ones I wrote, the stories we've read for ten months, 
I wrote specifically so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. John's gospel is different than the other gospels because John chose the stories he was going to write about. John had an entire lifetime to figure out what he's going to tell you and me today that would make us believe. He, uh, he displayed the Savior as clearly as he could so that we could say, I can believe the stories that John wrote. While the other gospel writers just told the story as they saw it, they didn't have a lot of time to write their story down. They just, they just transposed, this is what I saw, these are the parables, these are the things, this is what happened from my vantage point. John processed it, said, even in my old age, I'm telling you, this is what happened. And this is why you can believe. He came at it from a different angle than the synoptic gospels. Because he came at it as one of a friend. Talking about his rabbi, his savior, and his lord. And he wrote it in a way that demands a response from anyone who would ever read these words. So why did John write his gospel? Let's well, start this. John wrote his gospel so that you could believe, and in believing, you could find life. Right here, tucked in the end of his work, I know we have one more chapter next week, but it's interesting that right here at the very end, John's telling you that even though Jesus did so much more than what could ever be written in books on earth. I need you to know that all you need to know about Jesus is found in these pages. And this is why I point everyone who's a new believer to the book of John. The book of John is so powerful in how it just summarizes everything you need to know, every question you have about who Jesus was in 21 chapters. The miracles, the healings, the sermons are all a great part of Jesus' ministry. But they all point to this greater redemption story that was the cross and finally culminated in the resurrection. You see, the resurrection gives us hope of eternal life because it says that Jesus has finally conquered death. Without the resurrection, the forgiveness of sins doesn't matter because the person who's offering the forgiveness of sins doesn't have power over life and death. But the moment Jesus showed up in John 20 to his disciples, it changed everything for them. And it's why they were willing to go to their death for their belief. Through the cross, we're offered forgiveness. But it's by the power of the resurrection that we can be sure that Jesus is able to offer us eternal life to all who believe. Jesus did not come to earth to preach about being better, to be, preach about a, five ways to a better marriage. Jesus didn't come for that reason. He came to live, to die, and to be raised again, and to set all things right once and for all. And all he asks from those who he came to live and die for, is that you simply believe that. He's not far off. And like Mary, sometimes we're blind to how close he actually is. Uh, we're distracted by the problems in our life, the things that we all face. And we miss the fact that the solution to all of life's problems is standing right in front of us. It's not me. It's Jesus. Jesus is calling your name today. And it's time to respond and draw close to the only one who has offered you eternal life and has proven it through his life, his death, and his resurrection. He's offered you life and a life full of peace. And I pray that as we sing this last song together, that you'll take a moment in your seat right there to draw close to Jesus. And make this the day that you decide to stop doubting and to begin to believe in the resurrection. So with that, let's stand for worship one more time.